And without further ado, Michael Schwartz, Daniel Gruss, and Maurice Slip. Hi, and welcome to our talk, Meltdown, Basics, Details, Consequences, where we talk about one of the infamous CPU vulnerabilities of January. My name is Moritz Lipp. I'm a PhD student at Graz University of Technology. You can find me on Twitter, write me an email, or talk to me later on. My name is Michael Schwarz. I'm also a PhD student at the same university in Graz. I'm also on Twitter. You can write me an email, talk to me afterwards. I'll be here for the rest of the conference and DEF CON. And my name is Daniel Gruß. I'm a postdoc at Graz University of Technology, and you can also reach me online. Um, we also had a lot of other people who contributed to this work. Uh, Anders Fogg, Daniel Genkin, Werner Haas, Mike Hamburg, um, Jan Horn, Paul Kotscher, Stefan Manga, Thomas Prescher, and Yuval Rom, who are not here, but uh, this was a great collaboration with them, and uh, yeah, we're looking forward to working with them in the future. Yeah, so let's dive into it, and we start right off with reading kernel memory from user space, because that's pretty straightforward. Right, Michael? Right, so we have our virtual address space in our application, we have our user space, addresses all mapped there, we have the kernel mapped in our application. So why not read something that lies in the kernel? Yeah, why not? So we just pick an address like the Linux banner, get the address from that, and since every one of us knows C, we can do some simple pointer magic, use the address, cast it to a character pointer, dereference it, and then we can just print out the character located at this address. So this sounds really easy, so let me try this. I, I compile your code, I run your code, see what's happening, and it doesn't seem to be that straightforward. It, it sec faults when I do oh. that. Yeah, that's not really surprising. You can't just access kernel addresses. It's working as intended. Kernel addresses are not accessible, and that's how it's supposed to be. Um, any invalid access will throw an exception and it will lead to a segmentation fault. Yeah, but there's not an issue because whenever you have an exception, you just catch it and then continue your code. So that's pretty easy. We just install a signal handler so whenever this segmentation fault occurs, we jump back and continue our next instruction. Is that, is that how you always deal with errors? Yeah, that's what you're supposed to do, right? And then we can just read the value. Uh, <laughs> I don't think that's how it, how it works, Moritz, uh, really. So I tried that and still I get no kernel memory there. Okay. So maybe this privilege check actually seems to work and we cannot just access stuff from the kernel. And it's, it doesn't seem to be that straightforward as you thought it is. Okay, so maybe we should get, go back to the start. Maybe we should go back to operating systems 101, back to the basics. And there it looks like this. We have the user space, we have the kernel space, and they are isolated from each other. The user space can't just access the kernel space. And this isolation is a combination of hardware and software. And user applications can't just uh, pass by, uh, bypass this, um, isolation. It's a huge wall that can't easily be uh, crossed. And there's also a fundamental concept of all the modern operating systems and uh, systems we use. So we have this virtual address space with just virtual addresses. We usually call them just addresses because we have no idea about physical addresses when writing programs. And the CPU helps us with this virtual address space to isolate our process from all the other processes uh, running on this computer. And then we have this physical memory and the operating system manages that and there is this mapping that the CPU uses to translate virtual addresses to the actual physical uh, address frame. And this technique is our virtual address uh, techniques. We have page tables for that. We have a lot of tables in memory. The virtual address is used by the CPU to index this table, so it's split into multiple parts, used as indices to this page tables, the multi-level structure, and at the last page table, uh, then we have a page table entry that actually maps the physical page to this virtual address, and now we can zoom into this page table entry because it's 
quite interesting what's in there. Yeah, and if we look at the different bits here, we have the present bit, the uh, writable bit, user space accessible, write through, uncacheable, reference, dirty, size bit, global bit, and the non-executable bit, some ignored bits, and the physical page number. But the most interesting part for us here is the user space accessible bit, because this defines that an address cannot be accessed by a user space program. If this bit is not set, it cannot be accessed. And this should be set for all kernel addresses. Yeah. But in addition what we need to know is that typically the kernel is mapped into every address space. And in addition we have the direct physical map which maps the entire physical memory also in the kernel. So as we can see in this picture, there's two virtual addresses mapping to the same physical memory. So maybe we can use those addresses to read the memory from. So to summarize, when we want to load an address, we come to the permission check and either we have the permission to load the data, so we are fine, then we get load the data and can use it, or the permission check fails and then we simply crash. But that's what we see on the architectural level. But there are other attacks which allow us to see and observe things that we wouldn't do intentionally. And these attacks are called so called side channel attacks. And so safe software infrastructure if we have programs which do not contain any bug. This does not mean necessary that the execution of those programs on our CPUs are safe. Because information itself can leak from the underlying hardware. And those side channel attacks then exploit this unintentional information leakage by observing those side effects. And this, for instance, could be the power consumption of the device. So depending on the key that is used, the device needs more power if it processes a zero or a one. Or the overall execution time of the algorithm can allow us to observe the secret that is processed. In addition, we have those CPU caches. And maybe those can also be exploited. Yeah, I think the CPU caches are an interesting topic, so let's talk a bit more about caches and, and their text with them. So if you look at a simple program on the left side, simple C code, just outputs two variables, and then we have our CPU in the middle and our DRAM, and the program has to output a value, like the variable i here. What happens? We have to get the value somehow. So first, it tries to locate this value inside the processor in the cache, which is a really fast memory inside the CPU. If it's not there, because it was never used before, it has to be requested from the DRAM and it has to be read from the memory. The memory then answers our request for this value, responds with the value, and it goes again back to the CPU. It's stored there in the CPU cache, so if we need it again, then it will be faster, and then we can use it. For the second, access to this variable we see it's already in the CPU cache because we used it before. It's stored there for future access until it gets evicted by a lot of other data and we have a cache hit there. We can read it directly from the CPU cache and there's no DRAM access involved so this is a lot faster than this tedious process of requesting it from the DRAM and waiting for the DRAM which is a really slow memory and this is makes our programs run a lot faster. And we can even measure that if we have some measurement methods to measure really small timings like we have on most of the CPUs nowadays, then we can really distinguish whether such a memory access comes from the cache or has to be served from the DRAM. But if we have these timing really differences things. here, we can probably exploit that in an attack, right? How would you do that? Um, I would think of this situation here. We have an attacker program, a victim program, and they use some shared memory, some shared library. And this shared library, if one memory location in there is cached, it's cached for both. And if the attacker now continuously flushes this memory location, it will be not in the cache anymore. And only if the victim accesses this memory location, then it's in the cache again. And the attacker will also frequently re-access this location. And when the attacker observes a fast memory access, the attacker learns that the victim has accessed this variable in the meantime. And if the attacker observes uh, low, uh, slow access time, 
then the attacker learns that the victim probably did not access it. So we can see whether what someone has accessed yeah. some specific data element. Exactly. Great. So this is pretty low level already. So when we think about programs we have a certain architecture, we have an instruction set and the instruction set is just an abstract model of our computer that we use. It could be either x86, ARMv8 for instance or Spark. And it serves as an interface between the hardware that we're using and the software that we are writing. And when we talk about microarchitecture, we talk about the actual implementation of the instruction set. And as we know, we have many different CPUs, therefore, we have also many different microarchitectures like AMD Ryzen or the Intel Core CPUs or the Intel Xeon CPUs and so on. So if we now think back of computer architecture 101, how does it actually work if you have a program, what does the CPU do? And then we have this pipeline there where we have to multiple stages and first we fetch an instruction in, into the instruction cache, then we decode this instruction, execute the instruction in the execution unit and we can do memory accesses and uh, update the architectural register files and th we can do that in a pipeline. So if we are in the done with the first step, with the fetch step of one instruction, we can already get to the next instruction and fetch the next instruction. So we can pipeline that thing and that makes our program go a bit faster because we don't have to wait for one execution to be finished when we start the next instruction. But all instructions are executed in order so in the same order as they appear in our program. And if we have some dependencies that we cannot fulfill in the execution, then we have to stall there and wait until this dependency is resolved for this instruction so that it can, can continue. And if data is not cached, we need to wait for a DRAM until it's in the cache. But if you think about this program for instance here, uh, there are many things you can parallelize here and some have dependencies. So it would be very clever to parallelize these steps and only run the parts that depend on previous computations at a later point, right? Yeah. So not only does the compiler change the sequence of the instructions that are executed, also the CPU itself can optimize that. And when we have such a CPU who does that, we co talk about out of order executions. So we now have two sides, the front end on the top and the back end on the bottom and the instructions are fetched and decoded in the front end. And then they are dispatched into the back end. And there we have multiple execution units that then process those instructions. This means that we can now execute instructions out of order and they just now need to wait until the dependencies are ready. If they do not have a dependency, you can execute them right away. So this means that in your program you can have instructions that would occur later but are executed before other instructions because the execution unit has time to work on that instruction. But the most important thing is that those instructions are then retired in order because otherwise the program would do something different what the programmer did not intend the program to do. And only then when this instruction is retired, the architectural state becomes visible. And when an exception occurs, they are checked during the retirement and then the pipeline can be flushed and the CPU can recover from a sane state that it had before. So although this is called out of order, this yeah. means architecturally it looks like everything is executed yes, in order. Yes, because it's happening on the microarchitectural level. So on the architectural level, everything is the same and you just don't know how the CPU is built. Mm -hmm. But since the state only becomes visible architecturally. What does this mean on the microarchitectural level? So I have a good idea. We can change the code from earlier to my new code. Because I'm good at programming, we start right off with a null pointer dereference. Wait, 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 wait. What, what are I trying to do here? Yeah, so first I'm just dereferencing the address zero. Why is there even a volatile in there? Yeah, because when I wrote the code, the compiler said this statement has no effect. So it would optimize the code away. So you really want to have a null pointer there which crashes your program. Yeah, why not? Oh. Makes sense. At least to me. 
So my static code analyzer is not happy with that. Does he have a null pointer now? Yeah, who, who cares about code analyzers? There are so many false positives, like in this example. So at first we are dereferencing the null pointer, and then we just access an index of an array. Okay, so it crashes. <laughs> who cares? You can just catch the segmentation fault. And if we look at the flush and reload attack that Daniel described earlier, we can now just iterate with the flush and reload attack over the entire array and boom, you have a cache hit. So your unreachable code line which comes after the null pointer which should crash the program yeah. immediately was actually executed. Yeah, I, I and told see so that by using volatile. It has an effect. Ah, and we can see that in the cache. Yeah. So the ex exception was too late maybe, so it did something although it should have crashed already. So that's interesting. That means that out of all the executed instructions leave microarchitectural traces and that can be um, some state of the cache, it can be uh, other microarchitectural elements that are brought into a different state, but it can also be some concurrency effect. Um, we give a name to such instructions, we call them transient instructions because we somehow execute them but then they vanish before they are actually architecturally made visible. So we can through microarchitectural side channels then observe the execution of these transient instructions. We found on December 3rd, uh, we, we were quite busy around that time we were, because we were still busy with the research on the other Black Hat talk we had earlier um, by that time. But on December 3rd, we decided, okay, we should probably prioritize this and look at this now. And then we looked at this independently and all three of us came up with an implementation of the meltdown attack and uh, we discovered that it actually worked. So the only thing that we need to change from my code example earlier is if you remember the first example that we had, we just used the address from the kernel and dereferences it. But this time, instead of using printf, we just access the array at the index represented by the byte that we just read. And then we do the same flush and reload attack again as earlier, mount it over the entire array, and check if there is a part of the array that is now cached. So you say just adding another layer of indirection again solves all the problems, like all the time. I do. Okay, so let's try that. Wow. So I did that and I got a cache hit. Yeah. Exactly at this index of the value at the address I dereferenced. So the index of the cache hit actually revealed the value that's stored there in the kernel memory. So the permission check was not fast enough. This sounds like a huge problem. And this is meltdown. Uh, meltdown is using out of order execution to read data from any address. The index of the cache hit reveals what data we read because we encode it through this cache side channel to transmit it from the out of order execution realm to the normal world. The permission check is not fast enough in some cases and the entirely physic entire physical memory is typically accessible through the kernel space. And we reported this to Intel on December 4 and then continued working in this direction and one of the first things that I wrote on December 3rd that was still, um, I wrote a tool to uh, dump just arbitrary memory locations. Dump and dump memory and uh, yeah, kernel memory all over the terminal. So we also brought a demo of this with us. We just start at a certain address and dump the memory. And in this example, the address is located at the position in memory where there is a log stored for the descriptions of the package manager installed on the system and we just dump it. If there would be a key stored in there, we could also leak the key. So independently on what's written there, we can dump it. But with the code that you showed before, we can only read a single character and then do the flush and reload, but it crashes immediately because it's still an exception that has to be handled. So how do you prevent the crash then to dump the whole memory? So like in the beginning I said, when there is an exception, you just catch the exception. So we can just do fault handling to catch the exception, 
jump back and try again. In addition, we can also do fault suppression by using Intel TSX, which we'll see pretty soon. Yeah. When we got in touch with Paul Kocher through Intel, Intel connected us with, us with Paul Kocher, he told us that he found something he called Spectre. And then we thought, okay, yeah, we can also use this to suppress faults, right? To yes. prevent faults. Yes, so with speculative execution, we can also prevent a fault in the first place. So let's talk about this version with TSX because I think that's one of the most beautiful versions of Meltdown. Um, TSX is a really cool feature. It was designed by Intel to replace locking in certain scenarios, but we used it for a lot of different things already because it has a really cool side effect of suppressing exceptions. You just start a transaction and do stuff whatever you want to do and you can do illegal stuff in it like dereference a kernel memory address which would normally throw an exception but the TSX transaction just aborts there and doesn't crash the application. So we can simply start a TSX transaction before we do all this uh, meltdown magic. The transaction will abort but that's fine the program does not crash and we get the memory and we can do that in a loop and dump the whole memory with that. Yes. And that's a really quite fast, fast way. Right? Yeah. Because we don't have to handle exceptions like in an exception handling case. Yes. Also, we can use a set speculative execution to prevent the exception to occur in the first place. So, in this example, we have the speculate variable, which is just random modulo 2. And then, depending on the value written in there, we choose an address, which is either a valid address or the inaccessible kernel address. Then, we have the if condition. And depending on what the value is, we either try to read from the valid position or not. But by mistraining the branch predictor, who does not know at this place, okay, do I go into that condition or not, because it hasn't read the variable speculate yet, it will at some point try to read the kernel address and then use the value to load the address stored at the index of the array. And then we have the flush and reload again and then we can also leak the kernel memory. We can even improve the performance by a really nice trick by adding an additional null pointer dereference. We so really now you like want our to add <laughs> null pointers. We really like our null pointers so we, we learn to love them during the development. So in our code we just add a null pointer dereference before we dereference the kernel address so more illegal stuff in our application and this is really cool because it, it makes the attack a lot faster and more stable um, because apparently the, the null pointer blocks some exception handling and we have more time to actually leak this value. So this is all very nice but you can only leak data that is in level one cache, right? Not anything else. What if I told you that you can leak the entire memory contents with Meltdown? Okay, so what we saw in uh, January and also before that we had a lot of trouble convincing other people that we can actually read data that is not in the level one cache. It was assumed that you can only leak data that is stored in the level one cache. This was also what Google, uh, Jan Horn from Google Project Zero reported. And we tried a lot of things and yeah, f w for example, we experimented uh, by forcing the meltdown attack to one processor core and then on a different core we had the secret in the application so they can't share their, their first level cache, their one cache, only the last level cache and we were still able to leak the secret so it can't be the case with the L1. It also works with the L3 cache. We also made sure that it's never in the L1 by constantly flushing the secret and still we were able to leak it. It, it took a bit longer so it was not that uh, fast in leaking the values but still uh, we were e able to leak values that are also in the level 3 cache and of course also in the level 2 cache. And during this Meltdown would even uh, get the values into the level 1 cache for us in some cases. But we can also get got one step further by using uncacheable memory. So we mark pages in the page table as uncacheable and this means that every read or write operation will go directly to the DRAM. So it will 
bypass the cache entirely. So we make sure it's not in the level 1, level 2 or level 3 cache. It won't be stored in the cache at all. And if the attacker is able to do a legitimate load of this value by either issuing a syscall that then uses this value, on the same CPU core, the data still can be leaked. So we think that Meltdown might read the value directly from one of the fill buffers in this scenario. Because they are shared between threads running on the same core. So one hyper thread can attack the other one. So you can dump the entire memory, but it's horribly slow, right? Yeah, but why would you all want to leak the entire memory? You have a lot of that. You just want to leak secrets. You don't want to uh, leak everything. Just find something that you're interested in leaking and do a targeted attack using Meltdown. Not the entire memory dump, but something like, say for example, you use hard disk encryption, right? And use this Veracrypt open source tool for disk encryption and it's a software tool. So it, at some point it stores the key of your hard disk inside the memory and if I have that key then I can get your laptop, decrypt your hard disk and get all your interesting research projects. But it would not be practical to search for that key, right? It's just a small application and we can find out where the key is. So we actually did a demo on that. So on the right you see a shell by a user called the victim and he starts the Veracrypt application of the recent version that you can download today. Then he will create a new encrypted partition stored on the system. So you pass the path where it should be stored, the encryption algorithm, the size and then you enter your super secret password so that no one can read your data that you are storing in there. So we do that, we generate some random key by moving the mouse and we just speeded up the video because otherwise the video would take ages to present. After that, the victim is going to mount the volume. So he needs to enter the password again and then the volume will be mounted and he can use it on the file system. What the victim is going to do then, he will open the volume that is mounted in the file explorer and move his secret files in there. Now they are stored on the encrypted volume and no one else can read it. Until we start our exploit on the left shell. So we have the attacker user, he has no pseudo privileges and he will run, he will create a repository, uh, a directory at first where no files are in there and then he is going to run our exploit. What the exploit does, it checks for offsets depending on the kernel version that is used and then it's going to break KSLR. Because KSLR is active on the system, we need to first break it so that we can find the correct address of our identity mapping. Then there is a desk struct that we see later on where we can go through a list to find the process which we want to attack. So we do this. Then we can read either the entire memory of this process or if there is no ASLR active, we can read the key directly. Then we just use this key to decrypt the volume and mount it using a tool or extract it to the file system and now we have the files stored in the encrypted volume by stealing the key with Meltdown and we can look at it then. For instance, we can now get the credit card pin or watch the video that is stored in there. Why did you show my credit card pin in the video? <laughs> and actually this is the video of our Black Hat's best song, Pony Submission, last year. Okay. So, so using Meltdown, we can we do can targeted attacks as well. Target something very specific. Uh, we have seen we have to de-randomize KSLR to access the internal kernel structures, but this is actually pretty easy uh, because we have known values inside the kernel, for example, a version string, a Linux banner, and we know the default address where it is located for every kernel version and then we only have a really small entropy for the kernel address space layout randomization of just a few bits so there are only 64 possible randomization offsets and we just try them, read the value there and if we found it then we can de-randomize all the addresses and work as if we don't have any cases that are active. 
Yes. And the next thing like I said, the Linux kernel manages all processes in a list and the head of the list is stored in the init task structure. And the location of this is at a fixed offset depending on the build kernel version and if you know the kernel version of the distribution you know exactly where that is because it doesn't change for every user of this distribution. And each task list structure itself contains a pointer to the next uh, entry of this containing the process ID, the name and also the root of the multi page table. Okay. Um, so what we want to do is we want to resolve virtual addresses to physical addresses using the paging structures so that we can actually uh, add this physical address to the identity mapping offset to the direct physical map offset and then read the values from there. And we can do that by just iterating over the paging structures of this process and then dump the corresponding pages. They might be in a randomized order but they are four kilobyte blocks easy to combine them and we know how to combine them from the paging structures. The location of, in, in other cases the location of the key might be known if it's at a fixed address for instance because ASLR is disabled and then we can of course directly just dump the key. Yes. And then you know there is a key in this memory dump then you can use a tool like AES key find to extract the key from the entire memory dump. Then you can use for instance in our demo PyTrueCrypt to decrypt the disk image and extract the data. But what's important to say here that this does not affect only VeraCrypt. This affects every application that stores the secret in DRAM. The question now is who is affected, right? Which processors are actually affected? And uh, yeah, it's not only Intel. So Intel CPUs, most of them are affected uh, back from uh, many years ago. Uh, except for some uh, smaller CPUs like some atoms, they are not affected. For AMD, AMD, they seem not to be affected. At least we couldn't mount a meltdown attack there, and we haven't heard of anyone uh, being su successful in mounting a meltdown attack on AMD computers. For ARM, uh, there are the smartphones, and there's even one affected in the high end smartphones, the Cortex A75 that was published in January as well by ARM said this one is the affected core. You can also mount Meltdown on this core. And for all other vendors like IBM, they have affected architectures like the uh, power architecture, power 8, power 9. You can also mount the Meltdown attack there. So it's not just Intel, it's many CPU vendors, many CPU models that are actually affected by this bug there. Apple CPUs are also affected they said that all of their Mac and iOS devices are affected by the meltdown bug. So this is the list that was online in January where all those manufacturers said yeah these are our affected CPUs. But in the end there are also other CPU manufacturers. For instance Samsung with the Galaxy S7 introduced the Mongoose M1 CPU architecture which has some interesting properties and it was its first custom CPU design in the Exynos 8 Octor SOCs. And it has a perceptron branch prediction, a full out of order instruction execution, including full out of order loads and stores. What could this possibly mean? We can try to mount Meltdown there. So on the right we have a root shell because we want to obtain the physical address so we cheated there a bit but that's okay because on the left we have a normal shell as a user. On the right we start our secret application which has a string contained printing out the address that we then use in the normal user application and as we can see using the identity mapping we can instantly dump the address stored there. But luckily Samsung fixed it already so if you have the latest update you are good to go and meltdown is fixed. But the latest update was published last month. So that's so half a year after. It took them quite some time to actually fix it. So in the end, there are different CPU manufacturers as well, as well that are also affected, and we need to evaluate the attack on other CPUs, of course. As well, yeah. Yeah. And um, also, we need to notify the users. 
and uh, custom ROM developers. You also have the problem that if they, if, if Samsung patches it in their operating system, maybe custom ROM developers don't know about this if this is not publicly documented, right? So it's really important that we publicly document which processors are affected. Okay, so we have a problem now because we can't store a secret anymore in DRAM. Can we at least store secrets in, in registers? Sure, registers must be safe. Uh, yeah, that doesn't attack registers, right? So, with January, ARM also found a closely related meltdown variant where you could read system registers that are usually not accessible in the current exception level your program is running on. Affected is the Cortex A15, the Cortex A57, and A72. And the impact of this is that you could break KSLR right away, or if you use pointer authentication, for instance, the key would also be stored in a register and you could leak the key with that. Also, we brought a demo with you on the Samsung Galaxy S6. And when we run our deck there, we can see that immediately we can dump all the registers of different privilege levels that our user space application usually has no access to. Okay, so who is affected by this variant? Intel is affected. Um, we heard first rumors about that in uh, January, but Intel publicly disclosed this in May, May 21st. Um, they, in their disclosure, they said that almost every CPU is affected, um, and they called it Rogue's, uh, Rogue System Register Read. Um, yeah. So, we talked about Meltdown now. Is Meltdown a side channel attack? Everyone says it's a side channel attack. I think it's not a side channel attack, and I'm very certain about that. Um, because for a side channel attack, you would have to use a side channel to read some secret value. And we read the data directly, we directly access it. It does not really work any more directly. We just dereference a pointer and read the value into a register. How can it be any more directly? Um, okay, we then use a side channel internally for transmission from one realm to the other. But just because we use a side channel somewhere in the process does not make the entire thing a side channel attack. If you have some uh, malware running on an air gap system and transmit the data to the outside through some fancy channel, it does not make the entire attack a side channel attack. A side channel attack means that it's much more uh, passive. The victim is not uh, actively um, manipulated in some way. Okay, but if it's not a side channel attack, is it a speculative execution at least? Yeah, okay, so there, we, we often heard that Meltdown is speculating beyond faulting instructions and that's not speculative execution. That's just out of order execution. We're already running instructions out of order that follow um, after the current instruction. Um, but even if you, if you say, okay, I still want to um, want to call that speculative execution, fine. But speculating beyond faulting instructions is not even the actual problem. AMD does that and they are not affected. It's not the problem that anyone is speculating beyond faulting instructions here. The problem is that we are fetching and using real values for instructions after we are, are um, after we are having a faulting instruction. So the problem is fetching and using the real values here. Okay. Okay. We should fix that, I guess, because there's a really, really bad problem here. So we should find out how to fix that. The problem here is in the hardware. So the problem is rooted in hardware. So ultimately, we should fix that in hardware. So race condition between the memory fetch and the permission check, and we have to fix that in hardware. And we can also do a, a hard split of the user space and the kernel space. So that was already designed for ARM, but I guess no operating system used it before, so that the, the uh, kernel space is not even there if you run in user space. So fixing the hardware, it's a long-term solution. We cannot just replace all the CPUs right away. So we need a, a short-term solution. Yeah, we software. need to find something in software. Yeah. And the problem are the kernel addresses. Kernel addresses are there in user space and we can just take those kernel addresses, we don't need them usually, and remove them. If you run in user space, we don't need kernel addresses. We don't 
we cannot access the kernel, we don't need the kernel there. The problem here is that the user space accessible check is not reliable in hardware. So our idea was we just unmap the entire kernel in user space and then the kernel addresses are no longer present. And if they are not present, then you can't translate them to any physical address, so you can't run the attack. If you think back of our operating system illustration, uh, we would switch from this view to a separate kernel view and a user view. And now the user can run the attack, so the user can run through the wall, but there's nothing behind it. So the, u the user can't gain anything from it. Yeah. So actually, we published Kaiser in May 2017, <laughs> but not to mitigate meltdown, but to mitigate other side chain attacks, because meltdown was not known until then. And inadvertently, and luckily to us, it also defeats meltdown. We introduced a BOC implementation to the Linux kernel, which we also uploaded in May. And yeah, it was not that easy, so just unmounting the complete kernel uh, address space is not possible. The architecture still requires some parts of the kernel to be present, like interrupt descriptor tables. If we have an interrupt in user space, for example, because we move the mouse or enter stuff on the keyboard, we still need something mapped in the kernel so Code, we can. stacks, different things. Uh, stuff for context switches, we still need a, a few parts of the kernel uh, mapped in the user space. Also, in addition, when we want to switch to the other address space, we need to know the physical location of that. So we need to update the CF3 register with this address, and this address has also to be stored somewhere. And how can we do this efficiently? So instead of one page global directory, we now use two. They are 8K in size and also 8K aligned. And then we can do a nice trick. We can just flip the 12th bit of the pointer to switch between those halves and therefore of with those mappings. So as we can see on the illustration at the bottom, we just flip one bit, then we use the another offset which is our other address space and then we can continue and therefore we do not need to store the address somewhere else which we ne need to translate and then store in the CF3 register. We can just use the value already stored there, flip a bit and then change the address space and this is pretty nice. So Intel and others improved over our Kaiser patch starting from May. We already got first feedback in May and uh, later on we got also emails from Intel asking us specific things about uh, the Kaiser patch and then finally notifying us that uh, they uh, developed a larger patch set which actually makes this practical for the Linux kernel. Uh, it was later on merged into the Linux kernel as KPTI um, because they didn't like the name Kaiser for some reason. Uh, fun fact, Kaiser in German is the name of the largest penguin, the emperor penguin, but I think they were not aware of that. Um, so there were also patches for ARM64 and uh, yeah, it's not only in Linux, it's of course in other major operating systems as well. For example, Apple released the updates already in December, I, I think. And they, they had an option had for that on, similar before. on 32 bits. Yeah, where but they this was doing rather the opposite. Yeah, they, they didn't unmap the kernel in user space, but the user space in kernel. So that mitigated different attacks. And after this update, they also had the other way around, so they had have yeah. uh, protections in both directions. And of course, Windows also has a mitigation, which they call kernel virtual address shadow, and it's their implementation to mitigate meltdown on Windows. So, introducing such a fundamental change into an operating system is extremely challenging. Our proof of concept had many bugs, it crashed very frequently, we and did we were not very understand lucky. Why. <laughs> yeah, we were very lucky that, that we got the feedback. Uh, from the Linux community uh, because we were really unexperienced in writing larger kernel patches. And we had a lot of more time because at this yeah. point Meltdown wasn't known so we didn't have any stress in developing this patch. And we were also quite lucky in hindsight that we had this patch ready already a few months before we needed it. So even major operating system vendors with really good programmers made some mistakes in implementing this patch at first so in the Microsoft version they had a small mistake in there where they made the page table entries user space accessible. So from a side channel attack, or not a side channel attack, but a s using a side channel, 
to leak values from the kernel, they generated a real exploitable bug where I can read and write values anywhere on the whole system. So this was the total meltdown uh, bug in the meltdown batch for Windows, for example. So what now? Uh, how can we uh, go on from here? We expect that there will be more attacks exploiting performance optimizations. We are already seeing new variants, for instance, of Spectre and Meltdown popping up frequently, and I think uh, that this will be even more frequently in the near future. Yeah. This gives us a unique chance now to rethink our processor designs. Right now, we always optimized for performance, a lot of performance, but maybe we have to also take into account the security and find trade offs between security and performance for newer designs, designs that are better in terms of security and grow up like other fields did. Like it was the same in the car industry. We didn't get faster and faster cars all the time, but at some point they also made the cars safer than before. So, last but not least, we published our proof of concept implementation of the Meltdown deck on GitHub. You can download it there, compile it, and try it on your machine yourself. Hopefully your machine is already batched, so you need to disable the mitigations to test it. We will also add new code there that we just showed here in the presentation. Yeah. So to conclude our talk, in the end we underestimated microarchitectural uh, micro attacks for a long, long time. And with Meltdown we exploit performance optimizations that allow us to leak arbitrary memory, which is a huge problem. The countermeasures that we've seen come with a huge performance impact, so we need better solutions. And therefore, we need to find a trade off between security and performance, because we cannot have both apparently at the same time. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, feel free to ask or come to the QA afterwards. Thank you.